Welcome to Kremlin File, Anton. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you here with us yes. today. Hello, and well, thank you for having me. Yeah, let's jump in, okay, into our conversation. We've seen uh, a rise in the far right in Europe and also in the United States. And today we're going to be taking a deep dive into this issue and also what, let's say, the role that Russia has played in all of this. Uh, we'd like you to give us a little bit of a sense, okay, of the danger that this relationship also poses to global democracy. But let's take it one step at a time. Let's start with a little bit of background, okay, Anton, and then we'll move on, okay, from there. And from various articles that you've written also in your book, can you start by giving us a little bit of background into the far right and what their main goals are? Well, if we're talking about the far right in the historical perspective, uh, it's the movement mm -hmm. that was born at the beginning of the 20th century, um, mostly in Germany, but also in France. Then it spread, uh, you know, yeah, it was also born in Italy. Then it spread to other countries. Um, then, of okay. course, it was uh, the far right, far right regimes installed in the Third Reich, uh, or in Germany, that mm -hmm. became the Third Reich, then in Italy with Benito Mussolini, uh, then in some other countries mm -hmm. uh, known as you know, fascist regimes. Uh, after the Second World War, the far right in Europe, at least, it had to evolve because basically mm -hmm. you know, fascism was defeated, the Third Reich was defeated. So they had to somehow uh, adopt adopt a new new strategies so they right, uh, developed right. mostly during the second world war the far right evolved into three distinct forms uh some groups uh, very small fringe groups they thought that they would continue uh this you know revolutionary struggle or or uh, suited revolutionary struggle mm. to o overcome the liberal democratic consensus. And I'm, I'm talking here about Western Europe, obviously, because uh, Central Eastern Europe was mostly occupied by uh, uh, by the Soviet by the Soviets or by their puppet Soviet regimes Union. there. Mm -hmm. So the far right yes. could not really exist mm -hmm. on those territories for 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 a very long time. So we're, I'm talking about Western Europe. Uh, so there were these groups, revolutionary groups. They were very very small. Uh, the idea was to keep the flame of the, the fascist revolution, revolution mm. burning. Uh, they basically never succeeded. Mm. Uh, there were there were other people uh, who thought that uh, they would not be able to uh, repeat the the history of the Third Reich in terms of coming to power. So they decided, and that was almost uh, deliberate. They decided to translate the far right into the language of liberal democracy. They wanted to be more respectable. Mm. They wanted to be more, be more right. acceptable. This is what mm -hmm. uh, became known as the you know, contemporary forms of the uh, party political far right or radical right wing populist parties. The, the far right, <laughs> when we're talking with the far right today, it's rather we're talking about the radical right wing populist parties Yes, and yes. the yes. rise of those parties started to take place uh, at the end of the 1980s in Western Europe. Uh, then, of course, with the the fall of the Soviet Empire, with the collapse of the socialist uh, system in Eastern, Central Eastern Europe, some you know some far right parties started to appear also in that part of the world, and they they were actually quite quite different because they did not have uh, those conditions in which the contemporary radical right-wing populist parties evolved, they did not face this idea that they had to translate anything into the liberal democratic language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So parties, mm -hmm. the far-right parties on in Central and Eastern Europe were always more radical than their counterparts in Western mm -hmm. Europe. And uh, to some extent, uh, when we when we're talking uh, or when we're discussing the the threat of uh, the far right uh, to liberal democracy, uh, we should clearly distinguish uh, two types. Even though, even even if we're talking about radical right wing populist party, we need to distinguish between two trends. One trend is the the far right parties that are not going to. 
um, get away from the sort of more radical extreme roots. Mm-hmm. And those parties, they they do have problems. And I don't actually, I don't think that they pose a real threat because they end up being either banned or somehow criminalized, I like see. what we saw in Greece, for example, with the Golden Dawn. Right. Uh, we with also see Dawn, similar yeah. developments in Slovakia with the Marian Kotleba's party, which is really extreme. It's basically a neo-fascist party. And they don't they, they may have small successes, but they are definitely not going to win on the national level. The second trend okay. is actual mainstreamization of the far right. Right. And they yeah. and in some cases it's these decisions are uh, very pragmatic, mm-hmm. but they many far right parties they tend to become less extreme, less radical. And one explanation for this, well, two explanations. Well, one explanation is that people actually don't like radicals. This mm-hmm. is uh, you know, this is like general observation. People prefer more, more moderate uh, politicians, even when they are sort of fed up with either center wing or or, or cent- mm-hmm. center right, uh, center left. They tend to still they tend to uh, opt for less radical opposition uh, in, in 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 Europe and. Um, Anton Putin purports to be a defender of the anti-globalist uh, power, fighting for national sovereignty and self-determination. You've stated this is just a facade. What do you mean by it? And what is Putin's true ideology? I think that Putin actually does not have any ideology. He has ideas, and those ideas are quite you know, quite strong in his mind. Uh, one idea is that he wants Russia to be great, and he wants to be associated with Russia, with this Russian greatness. There is no ideology in this because you know, great Russia is yeah. not an ideology. You know, it's not like liberalism or conservatives or you know, fascism, communism. Uh, this is just an idea. He wants to have something like the Soviet Union. I think he's still a huge fan of the Soviet Union, not necessarily the communist ideology, but the idea right. that the Soviet Union was ruling the world together with the, the United States of America. Yes. So this idea that the Soviet Union was a great country, uh, a global player, he wants, he wants Russia to transform Russia into something like this. The problem, of course, is the the absence of ideology, and this has been raised many many times. That well, uh, the Soviet Union or the greatness of the Soviet Union, its its position on the world was founded on the idea that it was the main promoter of a very specific ideology. It was not just the great country; it was also a great project of modernity. Because mm-hmm. you know, communism, like fascism, like liberalism, these are projects of modernity. Anti-globalization is an idea that he uses as a mm. as a, you know some sort of substitute for either for ideology. Uh, he also played a bit with conservatism um, in 2013, 2014. Uh, he was also talking about the how it is actually not very good not to have an ideology. But the problem is that if Putin or or the Kremlin or you know his his circles, if they at any point establish some sort of ideology, they be, they will become vulnerable to criticism on the ideological level. This is why they're trying to combine it. They're, they're trying to take yep. uh, different points, different aspects from different ideologies and combine this chimera, uh, uh, which is not an ideology, right, but right, a chimera. Right. Yeah. So uh, this is why I'm, I'm saying that it's all a facade. But this is, not, um, this is not to say that there are no ideas. There are ideas, uh, many ideas. They, some, okay. they would sometimes you know, engage with particular like real ideologies to 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 invite them to different talk shows to uh, other programs uh, somehow feed uh, these ideas to the to the public so there there is a lot of there are a lot of 
uh, there are sort of playing around different ideas and ideologies. Right. Right. Okay. Interesting. Hold on. Um, yeah. How is Russia supportive of far right groups and objectives? Uh, there are there are several lines of support, and I would uh, distinguish uh, three of them. First is the media support. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Russian media, especially Russian state controlled media, such as RT or Sputnik. Mm-hmm. Uh, they give the European far right a platform that they lack in their own respective societies. Uh, for example, the French far right uh, cannot have the same positive coverage or at least neutral coverage yeah. of their activities right. Uh, right. In, in the French uh, mainstream media, while they can al- always rely on on on, uh, on the Russian media to give that coverage. Uh, then there is also political support. Uh, again, the French example, when Marine Le Pen in 2017 went to Russia to meet with Putin uh, just one month before the first round of the presidential elections in France, and that was clear uh, political support given to Le Pen from uh, from the Kremlin. Basically, yep. it was the message, Absolutely. she is our candidate, mm-hmm. she is our preferred candidate. Uh, there are also cases of financial support. Uh, Although mm. we don't know much about this during the uh, d- due to the uh, clandestine nature of this support, but uh, I want to uh, I want to mention a uh, note here that support for the far right um, coming from the Kremlin is always sort of a plan B. Uh, the Kremlin does mm. prefer to cooperate with mainstream forces. It's also it's it's also about sending a message to the mainstream. So if you if you don't cooperate with us, we will cooperate with mm. with your enemies. Uh, then there is also a, a very general dislike of the mainstream of liberal of liberal democracy uh, in uh, in the Kremlin. Uh, of course, they know that the far right in many countries they are in the opposition. That they have well fewer chances to come to power, but still they believe in that. In many cases, there are yeah, you know, there is this overlap in the, in the um, in ideas between the Kremlin uh, and 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 far right groups when they need, for example, uh, some friendly uh, election observers. They would engage with the far right. Uh, at least it was it was the case. In uh, Crimea. It was the case in Crimea. Exactly. Now, with these kind of groups, where we even have, let's say, let's say a little more mainstream to far right. Okay, that whole spectrum. All right. One of the things their stated goals is to, let's say, break up the European Union, or at least, you no, know, to get it into a lot of trouble. Let's just put it that way. And we're seeing a lot of secessionist movements, right, that are popping up, okay, all over the place. Already, we've had, you know, one nation, sorry, one, uh, the UK, okay, who has, you know, uh, that has separated, okay, from the European Union. Uh, And we're going to be getting into a lot of detail with that in uh, in another episode. But broadly speaking... What are the geopolitical implications if the EU and the US are further weakened you know, by the actions from these groups? I think, I think in the result, uh, they would have uh, Russia. So let me put it this way. Uh, one of the reasons why Russia is doing this is that uh, it cannot really become great again without weakening right. its adversary somebody yes. else right so okay. it's uh, there is no enough power in russia itself to become greater it's just not possible yep. so you can only become great again if if your adversary is weakened and uh, the the adversary of or russia is obviously the us in it's in, in the first place the EU is, it is a bit different. It is an adversary, but just because it is aligned with the US. Uh, moreover, 
um, while there is this rejection of, I think, of the United States as such, of its culture, of, it, of its politics, uh, in the Kremlin, there is a feeling that Europe today fails to be Europe. So Russia positions mm. itself, you know, Moscow positions itself as the real Europe, as the as the as oh, as wow. the Europe that has to be, you know, without multiculturalism, without those whining liberals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like the real, you know, the real Europe. So wow. at the same time, the Kremlin would never say that we we are the real United States. Because the rejection of America is so deep that they will they would never say mm. that, and they don't want yeah. to be another United States. Uh, maybe in greatness, yes, but not in the you know not in culture, not in politics. Sure. But with Europe, yes. So uh, while while the U.S. is the absolute adversary uh, for Putin's regime, Europe is not, uh, and there is. Um, there is, I think, a, even a struggle, sort of, you know, for Europe's soul that Russia believes that it is engaged in in this struggle uh, to free Europe from the American influence, to return Europe to what it used to be, like to, and and Russia would here be the main driving force of this, you know, return of Europe to to uh, uh, to its, you know, to its roots, so to say. Yeah, and Russia, I mean, going back to Soviet days, I mean, the only thing in the headlines is always, you know, America's about to attack, whether it's 1970s or today. I mean, <laughs> I checked Russian news this morning, and it's like they're breaking news. Uh, U.S. is preparing to brainwash Eastern European countries. I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, they're always on a war footing and, and, you know, and they need an enemy for internal purposes because, you know, how else are they going to sell uh, their, their lack of services to their citizens without, you know, selling the idea that they're protecting them from this, you know, enemy. Um, going back to the far right, um, have you, uh, like, what do you see the overlap between Russian intelligence agencies and far right groups as far as, you know, providing support, disinformation campaigns and, you know, and basically all the other tactics that Russian intelligence operate, uh, you know, operations involve? There are, of course, many actors on the Russian side who are engaged in cooperation with the far right. I do. I, I agree with you that uh, Russian intelligence is one of those actors. It's not the only one. Probably, it's not even the the, the main one, uh, but it's one of the many. Uh, because you also have, you know, businessmen who are interested in um, hmm. cooperating with the far right in Europe and then selling their successes uh, to the Kremlin in exchange for some resources. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, intelligence, yes. And I think it's mostly about disinformation. It's mostly about uh, injecting particular uh, narratives into the media space of European mm. societies. Um, at the same time, we do have cases, really strange cases, and uh, um, they may be results of the work of uh, Russian intelligence, but it just there is not enough proof uh, to even speculate about this. And then going back to like, for instance, the recent case, of, you know, going back to the secessionist movements, we see, for instance, you know, the California exit movie, Cali exit, the founder who is living in Russia now, who was behind setting up this movement movement for California to secede, he left to Russia and now he's coming back apparently before elections next year to again restart this whole California secessionist movement we saw his wow. ties with you know Russia and with Russian agencies same with Catalonia we saw the report come out and over the past year it's been trickling out i remember last year they said that GRU agents were sent to Catalonia to help separatists and then uh, Russia offered like 10,000 plus troops to, to help the separatists. And then now we see a fuller picture of the recent report that came out. So can you speak to that? I mean, uh, how how 
prevalent is that and how much should Europe worry about something like that? In most cases, I think um, actually European counterintelligence is aware of those operations. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, what's happening is the problem is that sometimes they don't really react. Uh, to the threats posed by yeah. uh, Russian intelligence. So, for example, Why? in uh, uh, in Austria, I think uh, mm-hmm. there is much that uh, Austrian authorities prefer not to talk about. And um, hmm. again, Anton, I, I, why though? Austria is a neutral country, and neutrality is part of their national character. Uh, Austria positions itself as a bridge between the West and the East. Obviously, this is mm. uh, you know this is ridiculous because Austria yeah. is part of the West. <laughs> yeah, uh, if, if, if exactly. even if it's not part of NATO, it's part of the European Union. Right. It's uh, it, during the Cold War again, despite the economic contacts uh, with the Soviet Union, it, Austria was firmly uh, in the West. However, they uh, Austria does not have um, uh, ambitions to be, you know, even um, you know, a, a global player. Uh, it's not like Germany. It's not like France. Uh, it's not like Italy. Uh, it's it's its foreign policy is uh, I would say underdeveloped, and they want to cooperate with everyone. So the level of uh, the level of tolerance of the Austrian authorities towards Russian malign operations is very very mm-hmm. high. It's not like in Scandinavia, for example, when they even when they see some Russian malign operations, they are basically intolerant because the level of, to- of tolerance is very low. In Austria, it's quite different. Uh, there are uh, very strong connections, uh, um, business connections. Uh, financial connections yes, between so Austria is. and Russia, so they think that they don't want to je- jeopardize uh, those contacts, those connections, and they, you know, they prefer to to keep quiet. Uh, one example here is the most recent attacks, like you know Havana syndrome uh, in Vienna, and mm-hmm. uh, the attacks were on against. Uh, uh, American diplomats, diplomats, and well, basically, I think also spies uh, who are like uh, stationed in in Vienna, and they, that, those cases were uh, second biggest attacks after after Cuba, and there was very little coverage in the Austrian media, and the Austrian authorities prefer not to um, you know not to talk about this, not to mention this. They are understanding. Yeah, I know. We know that Vienna is the capital of, of espionage. We know that some spies are working against other spies, but we don't want to have anything uh, with this. You know, mm. despite the fact that we see it's happening on the Austrian soil. Yeah. But they say, well, it's yeah. it, it's not our business. You you do whatever you want. Just don't you know. Don't engage with us, you know. Um, for yeah. um, the past decade, we've seen an increase in protest. And, I, well, I mean, even more recently, it's become, like, really, like, a big focus um, beginning over the past few years with, uh, we saw, like, the yellow um, uh, uh, vest. Uh, yellow yeah, vests. yellow vest yeah. in France. We see White Lives Matter movements. We see massive anti-immigration movements, especially before elections. Um, anti-vax now, anti-mask, you know, reopen protest. How do you think the Kremlin is involved with these protests? And besides disinformation and on the disinformation front, we see them spreading these protests. And like, for instance, we had protests in D.C. last year with Black Lives Matter. A million people gathered peacefully and like they will find the one altercation and replay it over internally and then through social media. And a lot of times we even see them altering the content like one of their, you know, offshoot outlets I saw was pa- like passing like protest in Portland, passing around the video that they made go viral of 
a Portland citizen setting a police officer on fire, but that actual video had happened in Mexico. So how often do you see this altered content? And, you know, and besides disinformation, what else is Russia doing to fuel these movements, uh, these protests? Well, as, as for the Yellow Vest movement, it obviously started without any uh, support from Russia, it's a you know it's a, a, a domestic domestic process in France. However, at some point, uh, Russian politicians, Russian officials, decided that they would engage with at least some parts of the Yellow Vest movements, and they even invited them uh, to Moscow to have talks mm-hmm. to uh, discuss. Well, we don't know the content of their discussions, but we know of the fact that they were invited to Moscow to talk about something. And uh, the person who invited them, Leonid Slutsky, who is the chair of the International Affairs Committee uh, in the Russian parliament, he is known for um, actively taking part in Russian malign influence operations in Europe. So I don't think that they talked about uh, cultural exchange yeah. or you know anything no. like this. Yeah. <laughs> no. so, Over coffee or, exactly, or cafe. Exactly. Vodka. <laughs> Uh, Vodka. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. so uh, we see some of these contacts, obviously, uh, and especially when it concerns the US, it less so for Europe. Uh, the Kremlin or the you know the media or its uh, propaganda network, it's uh, what they're doing. It's all about making trouble in the US. It doesn't really matter who to mm. support. The far right, the far left, it's, you know, it's about making problems. It's about, you know, again, uh, making trouble. It's a bit different in uh, with Europe because, again, for the reasons that I described in, in the mindset of, of the Kremlin, there are different, there are huge differences between the US, which is an absolute adversary, and Europe. So in Europe, uh, it's um, they are looking at um, they're looking at, for example, uh, public opinion polls. Uh, they are trying to monitor the situation in European societies and see uh, who is likely to win in the next elections, uh, mm. whose political force is uh, most popular then. Uh, and then uh, would they able would the Russian be able to cooperate with those new forces uh, that are on the rise or whatever? So they are constantly monitoring this evolving situation. And if there are protests, if there is some protest movement, they always uh, take into consideration uh, their contacts with the ruling forces. With mm-hmm. the ruling, uh, you know, with the ruling parties. So, for example, if they do have good relations with with the mainstream, they would unlikely they are unlikely to support the protests. This mm-hmm. is what I think uh, we see again in Austria. Mm. Um, there is an anti-vax movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not ext- not extremely strong, but even if it was. Uh, strong. I don't think that they that the Moscow would try to uh, somehow, you know, uh, fuel it because they already have good relations with the authorities. So why would they try to undermine okay, them okay. for exactly, the same reason? Yeah. Right. They didn't really cooperate with the Freedom Party of Austria, which is a far right party. Because why would they do this if they already have good relations with the two major parties? With... Exactly. Okay. So it's, it's always about you know looking at different aspects uh, of the of the political situation in every particular country. Uh, okay. Another another thing is that playing with the anti-vax sentiments is actually sort of a double-edged sword uh, <laughs> yeah. for Russia because it has it has its own problems. With the anti-vax sentiments mm-hmm. in Russia itself, mm-hmm. so and and you can see this clearly with uh, that the problems that Russia has at home, uh, it mm. will you know think twice before promoting a message you know somehow deepening those problems in the West. And the the, the COVID pandemic, COVID nineteen pandemic, is a very good example here. 
in uh, in spring last year when the pandemic uh, you know uh, emerged uh, yeah, it was raging there, yeah there was some some controversy uh in the in the russian media state controlled media about about covid about uh, there was even in this program uh, of uh, nikita mikhalkov i think he's a uh, he's a he's a uh, uh, quite popular uh, russian uh, film director and in one of his uh, programs on tv he was basically he was uh, pushing one of the conspiracy theories about the about the covid pandemic and his program was closed closed down because the russian authorities realized that well COVID is not only a problem for for the West, for the US, or for yeah. Europe. It's also a huge problem for Internally. Russia. Internally, so yeah, so they uh, they were quite strict about uh, you know about about those conspiracy theories. It's an, a different thing that they tried to exploit the pandemic, for example, by sending uh, so called humanitarian aid to Serbia and Italy. And they made a huge thing mm. about this, about you know sending those mm-hmm. airplanes to and Italy, US. saying, yeah, saying yeah. that well, NATO is not helping Italy, but we are helping. Yeah. We're such great friends. Yeah. And also, they tried to undermine uh, Western vaccines, trying to promote its own, its own Sputnik V vaccine. But mm-hmm. also, they at some point they realized that by undermining the trust into the Western vaccines. And uh, com- communicating this distrust, and also in Russian language, they were at the same time simultaneously undermining Russians' trust into Sputnik V vaccine. So yep. they they actually quite cautious about the thing yeah. that can you know backfire. Yeah. Yeah, they learned like very quickly kind of with thing. that this year. I mean, they're still continuing with disinformation, but internally, I mean. You know, the the COVID pictures are not good at all. And the trust for the vaccine. I mean, Russians are generally don't trust the government, especially with vaccines. And on top of this disinformation, I mean, they now definitely are hesitant to take the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Anton, um, from what we're, we're getting, okay, from this conversation, right? You're saying that Russia... No, has, let's say, this array of all the European, okay, and, and, and the West. And it adapts to each country, depending if they're friendly, they're not friendly, um, who to send funding to or support through you know, their own, uh, their own uh, information, you know, environments, so on and so forth. Now, they're doing all of this. What's the end game, Anton? What does Russia want in the end? Russia wants two things. One thing is actually it has nothing to do with the West as such. Russia wants to keep the regime in power as long as possible, preferably forever. Mm-hmm. They want this regime that they built, uh, Putin's regime, to survive uh, as long as possible. They understand at the same time, or they, um, yeah, they understand at the same time that it cannot really survive in the environment where the West, being economically, probably also politically stronger than Putin's Russia, hmm. they understand that in this environment it's not really possible to uh, for this regime to survive. Hence, they need to weaken what they believe is an adver- is their adversary this is the reason why they're doing this because they want to keep this regime they want mm-hmm. to conserve it they want to, it you know to last forever uh, or as 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 long as as people yeah. uh in power live yeah this is what they, well this is what they do uh the second reason is that they as any country in the world russia has its own national interests what they believe are they are, are their uh, national interests are, and again, in order to promote their national interests in the competitive space, in the international competitive space, they understand that they have to weaken their competitors in order to advance their national national interests. And again, this is what they are doing, yes. and 
what I'm saying is that some of the uh, some of the uh, interests, yeah, say Russia has national interests. So does any other country in the world. The problem here is that Putin's Russia sees the world as where where the game is always like a, it's a zero sum game. If you don't win, you necessarily lose. They don't have this conception that actually it can be a win-win situation for everyone. No. And this is, I think, part of the liberal democratic consensus in a way that we don't need to defeat our competitors, that they are you know, lying on the ground and cannot do anything. We actually can you know, have some compromise through diplomacy, through you know, traditional ways of influence uh, other nations. Uh, this is not the same for, for, for Putin's regime. This is a zero-sum game all the time. Uh, if we don't win, then we lose. And I think uh, there is this psychological trauma, of course, uh, you know, coming from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is where it comes from. This, the, you know, this belief that the Cold War ended, there, there, was the, the, there were these competing forces the the capitalist west and the communist east mm. and it all ended with the communist east uh, losing the cold war this is where the psychological trauma comes from um the re so they they have this understanding or they ha they have this feeling that this time if we lose then we lose so and it's just a, a very different approach to competition that they have. Okay. How much of this is also to protect how much money there the, let's say, Putin's uh, people are taking away from Russia and hiding in the West? Yeah, of course. This is also about yeah. protection of their own uh, yeah, you know, economic interests. Uh, that's for sure. I don't think that you know Putin himself is very much interested in uh, financial gain here. Uh, as a man who owns the country, uh, yeah. for whom entire Russia is <laughs> he his need. pocket, uh, sure. he doesn't really need. Right. And there was the you know discussion a couple of. So it's a means uh, for power. But he, he is, means, he's not. Uh, this is a means that he wields power this way. This is how he. he it's not the actual money itself, but yeah. it's the representation. What it represents. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think I mean, it's, it's. Go ahead. Yeah, I think he's mostly driven by uh, the considerations that I mentioned in the very beginning. It's about, you know, his ideas. And yeah. he, he's in, in the age where, where money, I mean, he has money. This is not, money is not a problem for him. No. Uh, for him now is the most important thing is to have and protect his place in history of Russia. He associates himself with Russia. By making Russia what he feels is great, he also, you know, he makes himself great. This is an idea that he has. So it's it's okay. not, in my opinion, this is not about money as such. Yeah, he yeah, he yeah. built he did build a kleptocracy, but in the end, he's using this kleptocracy for his own very personal, mm. uh, you know, goals and aims of a, a person who wants to uh, keep his place in history. Yeah, Anton is okay. very correct because, I mean, it's hard for people to understand in the West, but if you come from the Soviet Union and you're in that mentality, you know, I mean, uh, even, uh, you know, someone who sells bread for a living has this, you know, proud, like, like, so like mentality, like this hardliner Soviet mentality of Russia, like, well, the Soviet Union is great and the West is bad and, you know, we're powerful and, you know, and it's hard to explain it here, uh, but like mm -hmm. this, a lot of it, I mean, comes from, you know, the Soviet hardliner mentality and even the people surrounding Putin, you know, are from that time, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anton, where can our listeners find out more about your work um i have a website um actually there is mm -hmm. this website tango noir uh it's it's not really updated mm -hmm. at the moment although i sometimes write uh, a blog here 
Uh, and also uh, last year, I founded uh, an NGO in Austria called Center for Democratic Integrity, and which I'm trying to develop okay. and, uh, and publish some things Great. under this brand. Okay, so we'll be following And we'll there. list thank it on our can. website for our listeners. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So thank you. Thank you. Anton, Anton for thank all you. Of the information that you yes, shared. Thank, thank you so, so much. Thank list. you for having me. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and please visit our website, kremlinfile.com. This is season one, Kremlin File, hosted by Olga Lautman and me, Monique Lamar. This is a Bunker Crew Media production with executive producers Marley Clements, Jack Bryan, Grant DeSimone, Ben Brett, and Jordi Mycellus of Midas Media with associate producers Ruby Frankel and Sarah Metz. Theme music by Oreste Camarna. Sound editing and mixing by Joy Ellett. Subscribe to Kremlin File wherever you listen to podcasts. 